We begin by observing the Sutphin family at breakfast in a suburb of Baltimore when suddenly two detectives knock on their door. They are investigating a series of obscene phone calls and messages received by a woman in the neighborhood. The family expresses outrage but cannot provide any assistance to the detectives. Shortly after the children leave for school, Beverly grabs the phone to make an obscene call to Dottie Hinkle. While on her way to the high school for a teacher meeting, Beverly encounters Dottie, and we see in a flashback the reason behind Beverly's obscene calls to Dottie. Dottie simply shamelessly stole Beverly's parking spot. During the teacher meeting, the discussion revolves around how Beverly's son, Chip, is doing well academically but has an unhealthy obsession with horror films, which concerns the teacher. Beverly takes a relaxed attitude, considering that Chip works in a video rental store. However, the teacher sees this differently and suggests that Chip should consider therapy. After the meeting, Beverly wants to express her gratitude to the teacher for the enlightening conversation about her son. During dinner, a neighbor suddenly arrives, quite agitated, to inform the family about the passing of Mr. Stubbins. On television, there is an interview with a witness who claims to have seen a blue station wagon, similar to the one the family owns. The evening ends with the couple engaging in some bedroom activities, as Beverly has become unusually frisky due to the events of the day. The next day, the two detectives return because their investigation has revealed that the only blue station wagon among the parents of Mr. Stubbins's students belongs to the Sutphin family. Everyone present finds the accusations amusing, especially Beverly, who points out that the witness is a not very reliable pothead. When the garbage truck arrives, Beverly has her trash neatly prepared, in contrast to her neighbor Rosemary, whom she already disapproves of. She engages in a conversation with the garbage men about how someone should put an end to Rosemary's behavior. The garbage men make this remark in a joking manner, but Beverly takes it more seriously. So, Beverly takes immediate action and pays a visit to Rosemary Ackerman. Rosemary has Dottie as a guest, and after some commotion, Beverly persuades Rosemary to accompany her to the flea market, where her daughter has a booth. Meanwhile, the two detectives pay a visit to Eugene Sutphin at his dental practice. Further investigations have revealed that his wife has purchased books about serial killers and murder, casting her in a suspicious light. At her daughter's flea market booth, who was stood up by her boyfriend, Beverly spots the culprit with another date. And who can blame him for choosing Tracy Lords? Beverly has her sights set on them. Nobody stands up her daughter like that. She takes the opportunity while Carl is in the restroom to confront him there directly. And by confronting him directly, I mean piercing him with a poker. When Misty discovers Carl dead in the men's restroom shortly afterward and reports it to her mother, Beverly seems unimpressed, much to Misty's surprise. The neighbor Rosemary, also present, notices the blood on the poker and draws her own conclusions. At home, Eugene discovered his wife's collection of newspaper articles about murder and manslaughter, along with various other items related to serial killers, such as a personal audio recording addressed to Beverly by Ted Bundy. Following this, Misty visits her brother at the video rental store to tell him that she believes their mother is a murderer and killed Carl. The others don't take her seriously and make fun of her. The police talk to Beverly's neighbors, both of whom have quite a bit to say about her and have witnessed some very suspicious behavior from her recently. As the family sits down to dinner, the other family members express their doubts about recent events as well. Chip mentions that his friend Scotty believes his mother is the killer. Beverly laughs heartily at this, but then promptly leaves the house, leaving the others to assume she's on her way to Scotty's. The police follow Beverly on her way, but she manages to shake the cop relatively easily. The rest of the family is now on their way to Scotty's, but Beverly has a significant head start and a very different destination in mind. Scotty is busy watching adult films. Meanwhile, Beverly gains access to the Sterner's house, patients of her husband who haven't been following the dentist's instructions and have been bothering him on the phone during the weekend. At the same time, Beverly's family has managed to reach Scotty's house and tries to sneak inside unnoticed. Once inside, they catch Scotty in the act, engaging in self-indulgence, and the police also arrive. Meanwhile, Betty Sterner attempts to get ready for bed but encounters Beverly in her closet. Beverly doesn't hesitate and stabs Betty in the abdomen with scissors. When her husband becomes aware of this, he is also attacked by Beverly. He manages to evade her skilled scissor throws, and the two engage in a cat-and-mouse game. However, in the end, Beverly gets him too, by ruthlessly dropping the house's installed air conditioner on him. The Sutphin family returns home feeling extremely relieved because they now believe that Beverly is not a murderer after all. Beverly is already at home and offers the others a strawberry dessert. 
The next day, the Sutphin family is greeted in the morning by a fleet of police officers who are keeping a close eye on them. While driving to church, they hear on the radio about the murder of the Sterner couple from the previous night, which reveals the destination of Beverly's nighttime excursion to the rest of the family. They are all shocked, but Beverly tries to brush it off with a smile. She acts completely clueless. As the Sutphin family arrives at the church, they are met with a wave of mixed reactions from the congregation. Meanwhile, the police are waiting outside and receiving updates on the investigation results from the crime scenes over their radio system. These updates indicate that Beverly is now officially a suspect. They are about to take Beverly into custody when she manages to create a panic by expertly sneezing and getting some mucus on a little baby. In the ensuing chaos, she escapes from the police. She manages to escape with Chip and Birdie, a friend of Chip's, and they bring her to the video store where Chip works, hiding her in the back room. The first customer of the day is Mrs. Jensen, who returns a movie and wants to rent Annie the Musical. Chip informs her that she needs to rewind the movies because it's store policy. However, Mrs. Jensen is not in the mood to rewind them, which Beverly notices and clearly disapproves of. Not a good sign for Mrs. Jensen. After Mrs. Jensen leaves, Chip looks for his mother but can't find her in the store. Chip and Bertie become concerned and decide to go to Mrs. Jensen's house, given the recent events. Scotty notices this and follows them. Meanwhile, Mrs. Jensen is watching Annie when Beverly arrives and grabs a heavy meat cleaver from the kitchen, using it to bludgeon the poor woman to death. Scotty witnesses the gruesome act. When Beverly notices him, she starts chasing him. Scotty doesn't seem to be much faster than a middle-aged woman in high heels, so Beverly catches up to him at his car. He narrowly escapes, and Beverly goes full, grand theft auto mode, hijacking a nearby car to continue pursuing Scotty. Meanwhile, Chip and Birdie encounter Eugene and Misty Sutphin. Beverly coincidentally appears as well, and they all end up chasing each other. The police are hot on their trail by now. Scotty stops at a rock concert to blend into the crowd, but Beverly isn't giving up so easily and continues to pursue him there. When the people waiting outside the concert recognize the so-called serial mom, they happily let her in. The rest of the Sutphin family also shows up at the concert, but they arrive too late, and Beverly takes out poor Scotty first with a spotlight and then with a self-made flamethrower consisting of a lighter and a spray can. The police finally arrive and arrest Serial Mom. Five months later, the trial of Beverly, or as she's now known, Serial Mom, begins. She is charged with having killed six people. Beverly is dissatisfied with her lawyer and would rather defend herself. When the judge asks her, Beverly pleads not guilty. The first witness is Dottie, who informs the court about Beverly's obscene calls. Beverly upsets Dottie, causing her to be thrown out of the court after insulting Beverly multiple times. Beverly's family maximizes the media's interest in them and sells merchandise in front of the courthouse, clearly enjoying the spotlight. In court, the detective who testified about the findings in Beverly's trash, including books about murder, is called. Beverly then asks him what one might find in his own trash. The detective mentions various innocuous items, but Beverly reveals a find from his trash that the garbage collectors passed on to her, Chicks with Dicks, a rather explicit magazine and thereby undermining his statement. The next witness is Mrs. Ackerman, who testifies about how Beverly allegedly used the fire poker as a murder weapon in the men's restroom. However, Beverly turns the tables and points out things that also make Mrs. Ackerman appear suspicious, such as her scissors being used in Betty Sterner's murder. Another witness is the voyeur who saw Beverly in the bathroom just before Carl's murder. However, Beverly manages to unsettle the gentleman in the witness stand by skillfully exploiting his voyeuristic tendencies. She gets him to deny everything he previously said. The jury now delivers its verdict, finding Beverly not guilty. The Sutphin family is visibly surprised by this verdict and doesn't quite know how to handle the fact that Beverly will be returning home. Following the verdict, Beverly confronts a woman from the jury who had been bothering her the whole time because she was wearing white shoes after Labor Day, which is apparently a fashion faux pas. Who is supposed to know such a thing, though? And with that, Serial Mom comes to an end, with Beverly continuing right where she left off. I hope you enjoyed this recap of the 1994 satire by cult director John Waters. If you want to see more recaps of cult films like this, just subscribe to the channel, and I'll see you in the next video.